begin to lift up your voice. The Bible tells us to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Another place it said, make a joyful noise, all ye lands. Come into his presence with singing. Come on, if you serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords, I wish you'd begin to lift those hands. I think it'd be appropriate if we begin to open our mouths. Give God the glory, for he is worthy. He is worthy to be praised. Worthy of all glory, worthy of all honor. Amen. Would you worship with us as we sing this morning? Come on, I wonder if we can lift our hands in this house this morning. Hallelujah. Come on, if you know that we serve a mighty God. If you know that we serve a mighty God, I wonder if we can lift our hands and just worship Him. Come on, somebody open your mouth and worship Him in this place. Your mighty Jesus. Oh. He that dwells in the sea place of the most high God shall abide in the shadow of the almighty of the almighty God he that dwells in the secret place of the most high God shall Abide in the shadow of the Almighty, of the Almighty God. Because you are a mighty, mighty God. You are a mighty, mighty God. You are a mighty, mighty God. God, it's who you are. Come on, if you know his mind, somebody worship him in his house. That Somebody ought to testify.
Can we lift our hands in this house? Come on, can you lift your voice in this place? Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's worship him this morning. Let's give thanks to the king. He's a mighty God. He's an everlasting father. He's the prince of peace. Wonderful. Counselor. Aren't you glad you know who he is today? Whoa, praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen, amen. It's good to feel God's presence. It's good to come together in one place, in one accord. And how many came expecting a move of the Holy Ghost? My, my. Didn't we have a good time last night? Amen. I received something from God last night. I've come to a good land, a promised land, a land that flows. We always focus on the milk and honey, but we forgot the flow. And you can't have flow without hills. That's right. Praise God. Praise God. God bless you. You can be seated. We welcome you. We welcome you. We're glad that you're here. We are anticipating great things from God. I, I know that last night was a great, great kickoff of East Coast 2023, and we have every reason to believe that tonight is just going to climb the mountain that much higher. <clears throat> Praise God. Praise God. I mentioned it last night. I will reiterate it. The young man that opened the service, Brother Jake Azar, his family is in peril. I'm going to ask that you keep two prayer requests front and center in your heart and in your spirit during the course of this week. Remember the Azar family in Beirut, Lebanon. Remember them. The children came home uh, to the United States, and the parents are still there. And they have Hezbollah to contend with. They have Islamic radicalism to contend with. And they are an Acts 238 Jesus name church in the middle of all of that. So pray that God's hand of protection would be upon them. Amen. And then I want you to remember my dear friend, Brother Ari Prada. He is having a medical procedure today. Uh, a very involved, extensive operation. Pray that it goes well and that God touches his body. Our God's still a healer. Amen. He's still a healer. He's still a way maker. And we're believing God for great things and for his miraculous healing touch. Pray for them as though they were your family. Pray for them as though it were your brother, your, your child, your parents. I believe that the prayers of the church make all the difference in the world. Amen. Amen. Tonight, we're looking forward to a great outpouring of the Holy Ghost. We're looking forward to the ministry of Bishop, Bishop Johnny Godair. It's going to be great. And, and he, he, he's gathering his strength for tonight. And, and he said, Brother Urshan, I know i got at least one more left in me. <laughs> And, you know, for years, he would promote other people, and he would, he would uh, make sure that their ministries were strengthened and edified, all in a backseat, supportive role. And we heard great preaching over the years that was at East Coast Conference. But now it's time for Brother Godair to be in the platform at East Coast Conference. We want to hear from him. I know you want to hear from him, and God is going to help us. Amen. Amen. And before the service tonight, the hospitality room will be open one hour beforehand. We will have food and refreshments for ministers and their families. So the kids, the spouses, we want ministers and their family to come and feel welcome there. And afterwards, we will have 
uh, refreshments for them as well. Today, after the service today in the Godier Family Life Center, we will have uh, a meal prepared for ministers and their families. If you are an out-of-state minister, you have family, we want you to come, we want you to be there, we will have a great time of fellowship. Amen. I'm looking forward to what God's going to do today. Amen. We have got great things in store. We have great things to bring to you this year. We have some exciting things to unveil. We'll do that a little bit later. But right now, we're going to continue to worship God. We're going to continue to lift our hands. Amen. Let's glorify God and continue to magnify Him this morning. Come on, let's stand all over this house and give God a praise. Somebody put your hands together. Come on, come on. Why don't we give our great God a great praise? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, can you put your hands together? Come on, we serve a great God. Water you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like. Come on, you know what helped us sing it this morning. There's none like you. Come on, somebody lift it up. Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you Come on, somebody testify There's none like you Our God is greater, sir Our God is greater Our God is stronger Lord, you are higher you are There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like you say. There's no God like Jehovah. Nobody like you. There's no God like Jehovah. Nobody like you. There's no God like Jehovah. Nobody like you. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like There's no God like Jehovah. 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 There's no God like There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like to hold There's no God like to hold There's no God like to hold
at East Coast. I came to put the devil underneath my feet. I came to walk in victory. Praise God. Praise God. I'm not sure if we're quite there yet. I think we still got some praise left inside of us. Has he brought you out? Has he brought you out with a high hand? Has he established your coming and going? Has he written your name in the Lamb's book of life? Praise God, praise God. Oh, let's give God praise today. Clap your hands unto him. That's who you are. If anybody should know who he is, it's apostolic Jesus name people we're not confused about who he is God cares if we know who he is there's not a lot of questions he asked but one of them was who do men say that I the son of man am I need you to know who I am well you're John the Baptist you're Jeremiah you're one of the prophets and whoo but you folks know the answer He's Jehovah in flesh. The I am that I am. The same God that spoke out of the fiery bush is the same God that walked among them. And he's the same Holy Ghost that's here right now. Not another one. Not an extra one. Not another person. But that one God. Give him praise today. Give him praise today. Amen. 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 God bless you. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. We are glad that you're here. We are looking forward to the good word of the Lord. Before we do launch into that, we have exciting things to present to you this week. Things that we believe are going to help us navigate this age we are in right now. You're in an age where people are confused about gender and where geopolitical tension is rising where cities are literally being turned upside down the economic world has lost its mind but in all of that the church is still moving forward and we're meeting the challenge and we're not going to be left behind we're going to the Bible says they that know their God will be strong and they will do exploits you believe that? I'm not sitting in the back with my arms folded crying about. I have nothing sorry to say. I have no bad stories to tell. My God is great. My, I, I need a Joshua and Caleb spirit to rise up in this house on a Wednesday morning. The other 10 might be talking about how bad it is, but I came to tell somebody how good it is. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen. We're people of faith. We're not people of doubt. So we have some exciting things we'll be presenting this week. If you get a chance, stop by the Ed Building and see the, the vendors that are there. Support apostolic uh, vendors. I'm excited about that. Stop by the Biblos booth, get a mug, get a... Get a hoodie, get a, a shirt, and help us spread this gospel around the world. Amen. I have met two different young ministers that came here because of Biblos. Amen. And I'm glad that they're here, glad that they could be with us. We want to be a strength to you all. Hey, it's time to preach Jesus' name. 
If this world can spout their message of ignorance, spout their message of divisiveness and hatred and vile and sin, how much more should the church? Did the Bible say that, that where sin did abound, grace did much more abound? We need apostolic voices that rise up and be the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. And we've had several ministers that have joined us, so I will reiterate after the service this morning, if you are a minister, we want you to join us in the Family Life Center. People have driven in. They have come here from, from different local areas around here. We want you and your family to join us, your kids. We have plenty of food in the Godier Family Life Center, so don't leave hungry. We love the ministers. We love the preachers and their wives and their family. God bless you. Welcome to East Coast Conference. Brother Bertram, Sister Bertram, it's good to see you. Dear friends of ours from Corinth, Mississippi, love and appreciate them and others that are here. God bless you. The man that I'm going to bring to this pulpit this morning is is revered in Pentecost he has stood for truth for many many years he has pastored a great church and he has preached some of the most life impacting messages you will ever ever hear and one of the things I have loved about brother Alviar is that he loves the word of God and now in a world where that's becoming uh, more rare, we love and treasure men of the word. Men who honor the word of God and dive deeply into the word of God and take the time to mine the earth and extract the ore of God's priceless truths. And when I was speaking about, I was thinking about who I would have speak this morning in this session, I have been wanting to have Brother Alviar, and it was a good time. I'm so thankful that he agreed to come and felt led to come, and we're honored that he's here with us this year at East Coast Conference. I want you to stand with me this morning. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of appreciation. Brother Alviar, come. Take your liberty. Preach to us. We love you. We appreciate you. God bless you. Oh, let's give the Lord a hand clap. Put your mind on Jesus. Come on, put your mind on him and give him praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. Hey, let's do it the Bible way. There's a lot of hand clapping that goes on in church, but the Bible said, clap your hands unto the Lord, all ye people, shout. I believe when your hands are clapping, your mouth should be moving. Come on, let's shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph. He has been good to us today. That's it. Come on, a little bit more. Let's give him praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Amen. So good to be at East Coast Conference this year. Thank you so much, Pastor Urshan, for this invitation to come. I don't take it lightly. Anytime I'm asked to fill a pulpit, I consider it a great privilege, and especially to be able to stand before such great men. Brother Urshan is a voice of this generation and uh, <clears throat> I so appreciate uh, him also for his stand for truth. And when you hear him preach, you're going to hear Bible and not a lot of fluff. I like that. I know it sounds like a mutual admiration society, but... You know, he scratches my back, I scratch his, but, but the truth is, a back scratch feels good sometimes. Hey, there's, 
There's enough of them trying to claw your eyes out, a good back scratch. <laughs> Amen. We give honor also to the bishop, Bishop Godair. I've had the honor of preaching together with him numerous times over the years, different places. I've always been enriched by the experience, not only his ministry, but his companionship, fellowship, and conversation. And I appreciate our mentors in the gospel and I'm so excited about hearing him tonight because I believe we need to hear them as much as we can while we can many years ago I had the privilege of preaching at an elders 50th ministerial anniversary and uh, I was directed to a passage in the Old Testament. I'm not going to be able to quote it exactly right now, but it speaks about mariners, and it said, Thy ancients shall be thy caulkers. And it occurred to me that, you know, as a man ages, he may not have the strength to carry the timber and to do all the heavy lifting and the hard work, but the ancients were the caulkers. They caulked between the timbers. And uh, it was a very important task because these men knew how bad the storms could get. <clears throat> and they knew how important it was to have good caulking between the timbers so that the sea would not get in. And. Uh, and, and so I appreciate the elder men that are still with us. I don't consider myself one of them yet, but I'm on my way. I know I'm in the fourth quarter of my life. I had the privilege two weeks ago of turning our church over to my son, who also loves this great truth, and I believe he's going to do a, a great job, and I consider one of the greatest achievements of my life is to have raised a son in the gospel that loves this message. I know you're standing. Please be patient. I'm trying to get comfortable up here. <clears throat> it's good to see all of the ministering brethren that are present and uh, even those that slept in late and are going to come in late. Uh, we honor them, Brother Mark's preached such a tremendous message last night. He blessed us. And uh, he also made mention of the fact about preaching in front of the Sanhedrin. Well, <clears throat> I have stood before the Sanhedrin a few times. And it wasn't always a pleasant experience. And I know that the Sanhedrin is present. Maybe not here but they're watching and they're listening and some of them may not want others to know that they're watching but they're watching and they're waiting to see if LVR has lost it and if he's going to say something foolish or something that they can use as fodder uh, I'm glad there's nobody here like that, but, but uh, you know, they did that in the days of Jesus, too. They just hung around to see if they could snare him at some word. You came looking for some quote, some statement that you can take away and criticize about. I know enough about myself to know that I will supply you. I will undoubtedly supply you. And I'm sure the chatter will be great before the day is out, and I'll probably hear from some of them too. <clears throat> but that's all right. This isn't my first rodeo. And I came to just deliver my heart and a message that I have felt burning inside for some time. I've never preached this before. And I hope you don't mind if I stay close to my notes. I admire 
Pastor Urshan and other men seem like they can preach a whole message and not a single note. And I just wonder why that God distributed brains like that <clears throat> so unfairly to a few. And the rest of us, we have to use notes. And I find that the older I get, the, the more I need them. And the more I need to stick to them or I'll wander off somewhere and never come back. Uh, but I do feel that what I have to say today is important. And I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of Luke, chapter 12. Thank you again for the invitation, the beautiful room, and the lovely gift boxes with the snacks and gifts. I even got a new hanky out of it. And I was needing one, so thank you so much. And that beautiful banquet that we enjoyed last night and the delicious food and all the attentions given to us. It's just first class. First class, the hospitality room. Thank you to my ambassador, Jacob. Where is he? Did he vamoose? Or where is he? All right. God bless you, Jacob, for your help. Luke chapter 12, and good music, of course, good music and singing. Uh, such talent in Pentecost today. Beginning with verse number uh, 54 of Luke chapter 12. The Bible says, and he said also to the people, when you see a cloud rise out of the west straightway, you say, there cometh a shower. And so it is. When you see the south wind blow, you say, there will be heat, and it cometh to pass. You hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth. But how is it that you do not discern this time? Yea, and why even of yourselves judge ye not what is right? <clears throat> the latter part of verse 56, or the Bible, uh, verse 56, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth. But how is it that you do not discern this time? I want to talk to you for a little while on this simple subject, determining the time. Not just knowing the time, determining the time. If you're holding your Bibles, could you lift one hand? And let's ask God to help us today. Come on, everybody praying. Lord Jesus, pray that you would have your way this morning, that you will touch me, help me. I'm an imperfect vessel of clay with many limitations. I pray that somehow you would let your spirit rest upon me. Help me, God, to express and articulate what the spirit would have to say to us today. I also ask that you would put a guard over my mouth and help me to say only that which you would have me to say. Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive today in the name of Jesus I pray amen God bless you you may be seated <clears throat> the word determine of course means to conclude or ascertain as after reasoning and observation to settle or decide by an authoritative or conclusive decision to give direction or to fix a position. Now, it is difficult for us these days in times of GPS navigation systems to believe and comprehend that it hasn't been that long ago 
that men could not with any reasonable accuracy determine their position and their location. The problem was that they could determine latitude with relative ease by the miles that they traveled, but not longitude. And at the risk of boring you a little bit here at the beginning, I, I read a book some years ago on this topic, and it was explaining the difficulty. If I had in front of me here today a globe, I'm sure all of you are familiar with a globe, then you can picture with me in your mind the lines of latitude. Latitude are the parallel lines that go around from east to west. They're considered parallel lines because they are parallel to the equator. And no matter where you are on the globe, the distance between one degree of, of uh, latitude from another latitude is the same all the way around because they are parallel lines. Longitude, however, are what they call the meridian lines that go from pole to pole. And these lines, if you can picture it, they start, of course, at the pole and then they spread out as they go down towards the equator and then thin out again as they meet back at the other pole. So that the distance between the different lines of longitude is not the same depending on where you are north or south because even though it's the same degree uh, meridian or longitude, uh, the distance is much greater uh, near the center or the equator of the earth than it is when you get up near the top or the bottom. And so a partial solution to this problem was, of course, in dividing the earth as a circumference into 360 degrees. Some of this, a lot of this you're going to forget, but just hear me a moment. 360 degrees make up a circle. Is that right? And since... The earth makes a full rotation every day. Uh, 24 hours in a day, full rotation. Then they divided those 360 degrees into hours. So that every 15 degrees of longitude represents one hour. Because it takes the earth the same hour to traverse the distance between two lines of longitude at the equator, though they are much broader, than the very small area up near the pole because the earth turns at the same rate no matter where you are. And so longitude is measured not only in degrees like latitude is, but longitude is measured in degrees, minutes, and seconds. So that time is very important in being able to measure and determine where you are when it comes to longitude. Now the challenge for thousands of years, and I do mean thousands of years, was that mariners at sea had no reliable way to measure time at sea because whatever crude instruments they used on land would not work on a ship. You couldn't use a sundial, for instance. And even when pendulum clocks came along, because of the movement of the ship, the, it would throw the pendulum clock off or make it stop altogether. And there was no way to keep a clock moving consistently and regularly at sea. 
the result was that many ships were lost at sea because they could not measure longitude and they could not determine their position with any accuracy. Are you following me so far? Many ships and thousands of lives were lost for thousands of years because man could not measure longitude. This was especially critical in times of war when warships would be lost with the needed soldiers to engage in the battle and also ships transporting great fortunes would lose their way and eventually make shipwreck be lost at sea or eventually just be swallowed up by the sea so that even at the present day there are treasure hunters that go in submarines and they search for the wreckage of these ships that were lost and recover vast fortunes and much of the reason was not necessarily storms but it was because they just lost their way. Even great explorers like Vasco da Gama and Columbus could not determine longitude. And, you know, Columbus sailed west to find the Indies, and he found America instead. That wasn't what he was after, but it's because he really had no way of determining his location. You follow me so far? It wasn't until the year 1714, just barely a little over 300 years ago, that the British Parliament, after having lost so many ships, you know, Britain was a great uh, conquering empire. There was a time when the sun never set on the British Empire. And yet, in spite of that, they just got tired of losing so many ships and so many men. And so they instituted what they called the Longitude Act. And they offered a vast sum of 20,000 pounds, which in today's currency would be almost $15 million, to anybody who could accurately measure time at sea. That's a lot of money. And it indicates how important it was. And of course, a lot of people made the attempt, and there was a lot of goofy things I read about it that were attempted in the process, including firing cannons and barking dogs and, and, and all, all sorts of weird things that were attempted. But there was a clockmaker by the name of John Harrison who began to devote himself to the task and the challenge of making a clock that could measure time at sea. It took him a while, but he finally came up with a contraption. It would probably be about the, the width of this, of this desk up here, this pulpit. And the challenge was to measure time and distance within a half of a degree. And this intricate machine that he made uh, was finally the one that was able to, to do this. And yet because of the size of it and the intricacy of it and the expense of it and being able to reproduce it, it was not practical to put one of these devices on every ship. And so it was a while before he would recover the prize and in the meantime, he kept downsizing until he finally came up with a timepiece that was about five inches in diameter that could be held in your palm. It was called a chronometer. In modern terms, it was a watch. A watch. And so finally, they had a means that they could put one of these on every ships, on every ship, and determine their position. Time was crucial. Eventually, the telegraph 
was used in order to radio out the signal of the time and they would measure the time of where they were versus the time at a fixed location. And that would determine how many degrees, minutes, and seconds they were east or west of that fixed location. Eventually this signal was sent out from Halifax, Nova Scotia, and later even from the top of the Eiffel Tower. When radio signals came along, it made it even easier until nowadays they have global positioning satellites that orbit the earth and with the aid of those signals they can determine location within just a few feet or inches. And so we all have in our possession this morning either a watch or a cell phone with the time that is uh, that is calibrated according to the atomic clock to the second and we can all know the time and we take this so for granted and as we travel we make use of our GPS devices and we don't have to even know the complicated formulas that are involved in being able to determine and calibrate the time. But the amazing thing is that's only been possible in the last 300 years. So many lost their lives because of it. The bottom line this morning is navigation, for it to succeed, you must know the time. Not just the location to be able to know where you are and what direction to proceed to determine your trajectory and I'm here to tell you this morning that it is just as critical in the spiritual for us to be able to know where we are for us to understand what time it is what time that we are living in time therefore is also a compass you can't know where you are unless you can discern the time. And that's what Jesus was saying here in our text. By time, he was referring to a period of time that was of great importance. He wasn't talking about what time of the day it was, but spiritually, what time they were living in. You're going to help me preach a little while here today. And so he said, how is it that you cannot discern this time? What time? A definite and limited time. A season. A specified period. An opportune or right time. It also means the state of the times. Or a time when things are brought to a crisis because there are things that God allows to happen to push things toward a crisis in order to accomplish what he is out to accomplish the Bible said in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 but when the fullness of time was come God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law. But you've got to understand, everything that happened before that was not incidental. God had orchestrated it in order to bring them to that time. The great conquest, whether it was from Babylon, or whether it was from Greece, or whether it was from Rome, everything that had happened was moving them toward this crucial time. The Bible said he came as a root out of the dry ground. It seemed like he was born out of season, but he was born exactly when God wanted him to be born for a reason. And if they had been paying attention, they would have realized that they were living in crucial 
times they were not able to discern or recognize or understand. And Jesus said, how is it? You can discern the face of the sky, but you haven't been paying attention. You've had the information for hundreds of years. You heard the prophecies for hundreds of years. You've read it for yourself. You've quoted it. It's been embedded in you all this time. And then here you are completely aloof as to what time you are living in. Whether it was his advent or his ministry. You know, even when John questioned after a while, are you really him that should come? Jesus said, you go back and tell him. The blind are seeing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can just look at what is happening and match it up to what you know, amen, would be the case when the Messiah would be here. I am the man. God gives us enough information for us to be able to discern the time. Well, I came to preach a while. You can say man and sit there, don't make no difference. But I'm talking about determining the time. The signs and the indicators were so obvious, particularly with regards to prophecy and expectations. They had waited for hundreds of years, and they still missed it. Jesus said specifically, you don't know this time, because this time is important. Not only the most important time of their lives, but in all of history. Israel had waited for centuries for their Messiah, and they completely overlooked him. He came unto his own, but his own received him not. It was a crucial time. It was decisive. It was, faith. It was fatal. Uh, it was pivotal and, and of great significance. Jesus would later say in Luke chapter 19, verses 41 through 44, and when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now are they hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee around and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because... Because, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation or the time of your investigation or the time of your inspection because this was God Almighty walking around in flesh among them. You know, when the prophet had said the glory of the latter house will be greater than the former, it wasn't because it would have more gold or more precious stones or more ornate workmanship, but it would be because God Almighty would step foot in that house. Even his disciples, he said, Tear this down, and in three days I'll raise it up again. And they thought he was talking about a building. He was talking about himself and his body and the death that he would die. How many times did he have to rebuke his disciples? Aren't you paying attention? Aren't you listening? Aren't you getting what I'm telling you? Let's worship the Lord here today. Yes, 
their destruction became inevitable, not for lack of military might, but because they didn't properly understand the time they were living in. Now, I know that Jesus did say in Acts 1 and 7, he said to his disciples when they asked him, uh, when, when Peter asked him, will you at this time restore Israel? It's like, I mean, this is, this is crunch time. And the man is still thinking politically. And Jesus said, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. There are indeed a lot of things that happen in governments and in world events that we do not understand or have any control over. And I don't care what your political inclination is today, it's not going to get any better. I know you're hoping for this guy to become Speaker of the House and this guy to win the presidency, and we all have our preferences. But we have very little control over that. So you can demonstrate, you can pick it, you can, uh, you can have your rallies all you want to. That's out of our control. I know we should do our duty as citizens and vote and whatever. Amen, if that even matters anymore. But we don't have a lot of control over it. There's been a lot of tyrants rise up over the centuries of time, and a lot of good people lived during that time. And they prayed just like we pray, but the tyrants were still there. That's not where our attention should be. That's not what we should be calibrating by. You all hearing me? Amen. And so we cannot discern those things which are in his power, in his hand, in his control. But spiritually, we can. And the Bible still says, and I know this is old stuff, but Romans 13, verses 11 and 12, and that knowing the time, everybody say it with me, knowing the time, that now it is what? High time to do what? Awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Hey, if that was true 2,000 years ago, how much truer is it today? The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. It is important today for us to know and determine the time. First Chronicles chapter 12 verse 32 said, And of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do. God help us in 2023 to have enough voices around of men who understand the times and are able to give us instruction about what the church ought to do. I, I'd like to think that's why we're here today, not just to hear another sermon, but to get direction. Is anybody looking for direction today? The Bible gives us other indications of the last days. It says, for instance, in 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5, you know it well. This know also that in the last days, say it with me, last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, 
high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. I was preaching from that passage to our assembly several weeks ago, and you know, it just hit me with a new forcefulness. Surely these things existed in the time of Paul. All of these characteristics and attributes that he mentioned were prevalent in his time. I know they were because he addressed a number of them in his epistles. They had found some of them their way into the church. And so they were there already. He was dealing with it already. Why would he say then in the last days, perilous times, and then go through this list? I think he's telling us that in the last days, these things would intensify and would be at a level that was unprecedented. And if you haven't been paying attention, honey, we're living in those days right now. Or maybe this isn't what you came to hear, but I came to talk to you about the time we're living in. When the apostle said, lovers of their own selves, he wasn't really talking about a homosexual spirit, although if you want to apply it that way, help yourself, but he's talking about self-love, a selfishness, a self-centeredness. That would be unprecedented. This is the day of the selfie. Social media is all about me, 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 me. Mine, mine, mine. We're only concerned about ourselves. Our own wants, our own wishes, our own preferences, our own priorities. It's not all about you, honey. Without natural affection. Again, it's not talking necessarily about some kind of immoral spirit. You know, lesbianism and, 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 and gay pride, and, although uh, that would probably apply too. But it's talking about people who are incapable of receiving affection or showing it properly. This is the day of the dysfunctional. The dysfunctional has become the normal. People come to church, they, they don't come from families where there's mom and dad and all the kids sitting around the table eating dinner together. They come from a fractured, broken up past like many of you have. Many of them don't know who their daddies are. They were raised by grandparents or other relatives. They don't know what it is to have somebody put their arm around them and say, I love you, amen, and meet it in a pure way. And they come, their emotions are broken. They don't know how to receive affection and they don't know how to show it. Hallelujah. Truce breakers. That means not, not having any commitment or loyalty. You can be seated. They don't have any loyalty to relationships. No loyalty to friendships. I marvel at how little it takes to fracture a friendship these days. And also commitment to church. I heard the other day that the average Christian in America of all denominations stays in a church an average of three and a half years before they change churches. Oh, I'm glad it's not like that in Pentecost, right? <laughs> Tighten up, whatever. When you first show up, oh, this is the church I've been looking for. Woo, I just love my pastor. My pastor's wife, she's just the most wonderful in these people. Oh, they just receive me with such love. Two or three years later, they know all the dirt and all the warts and all the wrinkles. And, you know, it's like when you, when you buy a car, you just extol all of its virtues to everybody. But when you're ready to trade it in, it's a piece of junk. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's right. And that happens in churches too. You know what you need to do? Pour concrete around your foot and stay put. You got a good church, a good man of God that preaches you the truth. Then stay put. No church is everything it needs to be. No church is perfect. No pastor is perfect. No congregation is perfect. You hang around long enough, you'll find faults and imperfections about every one of us. We're not here for each other. We're here for him. Come on now. Can I just preach a while? First Timothy 4 and verses 1 and 2. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. In the latter times, some will depart. I'm glad it didn't say everybody. Some are going to depart, but some ain't. Some are going to stay true. Give heed to doctrines of devils. You have to be careful what you listen to. All these voices that are out there that you're tuning in to. Well, I'm strong enough. I can cope with it. Talk to the angels in heaven who saw one of the rogue, a rogue angel turn one third of heaven's angels into rebels. Here again, you think you found a perfect church. These angels were in heaven. And still Satan was able to persuade them. How smart do you think you are? How intelligent are you? You don't have that high IQ, my friend. The devil can find a way to deceive you and have you running off after this and running off after that and you might get some new insight and revelation into something that your pastor doesn't even have. You know I'm saying that in tongue in cheek, right? And running here and running there. Now here's part of the problem, and please hear me. Here's part of the problem. In 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4, you know the verse as well. Paul said, for the time will come when they will not, what? Endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. That's why prosperity preaching is so popular. That's why there's these great mega churches where they only tell people how wonderful they are, how great they are, because everybody wants to be a hero. Everybody wants to be a star. Everybody wants to feel like they're super special. You know what we are? We're lost without the blood of Jesus Christ. You know what we are? We're on our way to hell without his grace and his mercy. What is going to insulate us in these last days against these doctrines of devils and seducing spirits is a return to old-time, old-fashioned Bible teaching about doctrine. I'm sorry, I'm tired of going through whole conferences sometimes and, and only hear Acts 2.38 mentioned in passing. And only hear the oneness of the Godhead mentioned in passing. Yeah, because that isn't popular. That isn't popular. 
You know, some of us came up in these, uh, and, and this is no, no slam or anything on this meeting whatsoever. You've got a pastor that loves this message. This church does. And I believe that's the kind of men that are here. Praise the Lord. But hear me today. If we're not careful, the focus is all going to be on the shout. And I'm all for the shout. Man, let's have high church. But you know, amen, why I'm still here is because of those old Bible conferences, Brother Urshan, where somebody got up and they taught for an hour and a half, 45 minutes, about the oneness of the Godhead. Jesus' name, baptism, Acts 2.38. We need to preach one God to the world looks flat. We need to preach Acts 2.38 till the world looks flat till these young people and these other folks, when they hear these doctrines of devils and seducing spirits, they will know that's not right. I don't care how big a church it is. I don't know how great, don't care how great a choir or what they got going on. Can I just be myself? Might be my one and only time here, but a relative of mine sent me some texts here not long ago, and they, uh, this person had left the truth and gone into the charismatic movement, and they were talking about the scent of God. Uh, they were having such a move of God, they could smell him. Somebody said it smelled like lilacs, and now there's something else. They didn't talk about the the individual with some little spitzer, you know, just psst, psst. Oh, the scent of God. And I read those texts and I thought, how dumb can you get? And yet people are swept up by all of that. A pulpit splitting in half and all kinds of nonsense. I read in my Bible that the devil can operate wonders too. You know what you need? You need your ears tuned to this old-fashioned apostolic message and doctrine. You need to get excited when somebody preaches, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Oh, that's old stuff. Tell me something I haven't heard before. This is what's going to keep us. This is what's going to... The only thing that's going to help us to find our way is being able to measure ourselves by something that is constant, something that is fixed, something that has stood the test of time. Where are we in relation to this book? Lift your hands and worship him again. Come on now. I worry when we start measuring services only in terms of how much people shouted. I want to shout too. I want to feel good too. But it's reassuring when somebody gets up and just preaches the book. I need to know where I'm at. I need to know what time it is. I'm afraid that we've gotten a little bit out of balance with a lot of this. Please, please don't take me wrong. I'm not trying to be critical. But if we're not careful, we'll raise a generation of sermon junkies. They just want to hear, you know, some catchy sermon, some catchy title. Then they go have a hamburger. God give us more preaching that will put us on our knees. Searching ourselves. Weeping in the presence of the Lord. Now, I know we need a lot of help today. We do. Amen. But when are we going to mature 
spiritually past infancy and become those that can handle the strong meat of the word? Why are we in spiritual jeopardy at every hour so that we constantly need rescuing? Amen. Praise the Lord. I, I hope this isn't coming out wrong. I've asked God to help me. But now we, we've been saved by preaching many times. I understand that. But should we come to every meeting just barely on the edge? Needing somebody to save us from ourselves or save us from catastrophe? When are we going to get spiritually mature enough to get on our knees, pray, and get a consecration and a walk with God and learn to square our shoulders? Come on now. We need to get past being a wimp. We're raising up a generation of beta males. Beta males that can't say no to their wife when she gets upset and wants to change churches. You see, one of the old elders that's gone now used to tell me, hey man, that uh, when a man suddenly changes in his disposition toward you, there's a woman behind it. I'm not trying to slam the women here, but you know, I know you the he-man out in the job. I know. Yeah, I know you can lift all kinds of weight, and I, I know you can sink those three-pointers. I, I know you... You, 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 got, you, you got a reputation with all of that. But when it comes to a woman crying, eh, somebody hurt my feelings. We need to change churches. I'm sure there's nobody here like that today, but where's the men that will say, uh-uh, no, sorry. You just pray over it. Get, get that out of your heart. Get that out of your spirit. Where's... We're staying right here. I don't know how many folks I've lost in recent years because of beta males that couldn't say no. If you're here needing somebody to pamper and pat you and pat you on the back, you came looking for safe spaces, coloring books, pacifiers, Somebody to soothe your spirit. Man up and suit up. We're in a war, honey. Fight the good fight of faith. Strap on the whole armor of God. You know why? Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. We've got a powerful adversary. We've got a potent opposing spirit. It doesn't want us to have victory in our church services. It doesn't want us to have a good worship service, a good prayer meeting. It doesn't want the preacher to preach trying to stuff every word back down his throat. That's when somebody clad in the armor needs to get on their feet and say, Preach, Pastor! Preach! <laughs> that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. This is the evil day. It's here. It's upon us. Get some spiritual fortitude about you. Square your shoulders. And instead of needing somebody to give you a towel to cry on, get in here and fight.
I don't know how long I've been preaching. I'm going to try to hurry, but be seated. Jesus also said in Matthew 24, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? I know that's a three-pronged question. And I'm not going to get into all that. But Jesus did say, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences, and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. That's good news. You're not always going to get delivered. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended. And shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. That, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now, you don't need me to tell you there's a lot of unrest in our world today. There's a great power shift that's taking place. The sovereignty of nations is being lost and taken over by other entities that are calling the shots, that are determining the course of action for much of the world today. It's unbelievable. And I've never seen it on this wise. And it's only going to get worse. There is going to come a time when a man is going to rise up and say, I have the answer. Now, then here in the last few days, as Pastor Urshan has mentioned, this conflict between Israel and Hamas, 300,000 soldiers that are at readiness right now to make their assault on Gaza. And it's a sad situation because they're taking the bait. The massacre of a thousand and so many hundreds of, of innocent civilians in such a brutal way was to draw them into this. That was the whole purpose of it to create the outrage that would make Israel react and come at them because now then, if they do make their assault on Gaza, the guerrilla warfare is going to be brutal. It's going to be bloody. And there's going to be atrocities and there's going to be a lot more innocent people die and the outrage of the world is going to be incensed against Israel, which is what they're counting on. And, and Israel knows this, but they almost don't have a choice. Their citizens demand it. They want revenge. But understand this, nothing happens in Israel that God hasn't allowed. And I don't know if this is the beginning of the end. We've been in that position before. You know, they preached... When those tanks go across that barbed wire fence, the rapture is going to take place. And <laughs> yes, 88 reasons why the Lord was going to come in 1988. That's the year I became pastor in Louisiana. And boy, people were selling their houses and they were getting ready. The rapture was about to take place. The Bible still does say that we do not know the day nor the hour. That's not for us to know. However, this is going to happen someday. Whether you believe in pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, things are going to wind up someday, honey. We might be living on the cusp of it and realize that what is taking place there now, today, God is behind it. 
Is he the author of such brutality? And so, no, that's what men do. But if God has permitted it, it's for a reason. And we'd best be paying attention. Y'all hearing me? And then just recently we went through this nasty business of the pandemic. Boy, what confusion there was there. I thought I was going to have a church split over masks. And I, you know, whatever you want to think about all that, some of us, we didn't know what we were dealing with. We did the best we could. We didn't know how bad it was going to get, and I don't know about you, but I looked across my congregation, and I didn't see many that I would want to sacrifice by being stupid. Now, there were a few. <laughs> but they weren't the vulnerable ones. It'd take a lot more than coronavirus to take them out. And so, you know, in hindsight, maybe we could have handled things differently and better, and there's the the conspiracy people and there's people that are reading all this stuff on the internet and they're coming to church and they're sowing all kinds of discord. And we had people that vanished into thin air. I don't know what happened to them. We, we tried to get in touch with them. They, we, they don't respond to calls, texts, and nothing. They just disappeared. We went through all of that. But in the process, there was a monumental shift that took place worldwide. And that has not changed, and systems and, and, and powers and authorities have been put in place that are not going to go away. You all hearing me? And, and so we see these things happening, and yet a lot of times we just come to church. We just want a little touch. We cannot realize that we are living in momentous times. I wonder if the Lord was here today in, in a physical presence if he would not ask the same question. How is it that you cannot discern this time? Can you give me just a little bit longer? Now, now we know about all of that and these things that Jesus spoke about and we also know about the love of many Waxing cold. But I, I think maybe we could also give a, a moment of a time of time and attention to those that would be offended and betray one another. Conservative brethren turning on one another. Dividing fellowships over petty disputes. Though it's not petty to them, I understand. With them, everything is life and death, heaven and hell. But sometimes we latch on to things and make mountains out of molehills. And the devil stands aside and laughs. The liberals, they stay united. The conservatives are always looking for new reasons to divide. Well, it's true. He went on to say in verse 42, Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come, but know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered the house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to smite his fellow servants. To eat and drunk with eat and drink with the drunken, 
The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour when he is not aware of and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Can I just say this morning and then I'll, I'll leave it maybe, but can we beware that we don't fall into the trap of, of beating up on our own fellow servants? Not because of compromise, we're against compromise, but just for doing things a little bit different. They do things a little bit different than you. They conduct their services just a little different than you. They sing songs that you don't like, new songs. Well, we could spend some time there. Let me just be up front. I like the old songs better. You know why? Because I'm old. I'm more familiar with those songs. Man, some of these new songs, I can't even follow them on the screen. The words move too fast. I catch about every second or third word. But hey, if it's giving glory to God, I'll at least do a little juke and jive and clap my hands and worship the Lord. Don't have to stand there with a sour attitude. And I, I've been one that have talked a lot about this. I, I like amazing grace. And I like I'll fly away. And I like there's power in the blood. And I will say this, let's make sure our new songs include the blood and Calvary and Jesus and the heaven. It's not all about our little hurts and feelings. Hey, if we give glory to God, the power will fall. It's not all in the beat. It's not all in the music. But I've been in different parts of the country, Brother Urshan. Hey, it's early and I'm, I'm feeling my oats up here. I don't guess we have anything important to... Can I just preach a while? Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And, and, and so, yeah, I like the older songs because I know them better. And I can follow them better. And so we tried to resurrect some of them in our church. They'd put the, when I went there, they'd put the song books away 20 years previously. Said, bless God, we're going back to the old paths. We're getting these song books. They didn't even know how to read out of them. It's like. If it wasn't on the screen, they didn't know how to read it. And then I'm singing songs that are making me tear up and they're, it's not moving them at all. I don't get it, but let me tell you something. Amazing Grace was a new song one day. And a lot of these newer songs are gonna fall by the wayside. They're not gonna last and they're not gonna endure, but some of them will. And some of them will become part of our music repertoire for years to come. What God blesses and what God anoints is going to stay around. But you're not appointed to be the critic to come to church and decide. And if you'll break fellowship just because they sing songs you don't like, Well, here's what I started to say. I've gone to other parts of the country where they were singing what was to them old songs. I'd never heard them before. So even though they were old songs to them, they were new to me. I couldn't get into them because I didn't know them either. But they're still boasting and bragging about hanging on to the old. Praise God. I'm sorry that this offends you.
And let, let's be honest, some of them old songs weren't all that much to sneeze at anyway. Man, I remember some of them. I've been up on the mountain and I won't come down. I've been up on the mountain and I won't come down. The devil can't do me no harm. No harm, no harm, no. You know, there's not a lot of depth there, okay? But man, they'd shout and beat their tambourines and run the aisles. Going upon the mountain and I won't. Hey, whatever, whatever gets you out of your selfish, self-centeredness and gets you worshiping God. Here's another one that I hope I never hear again. Devil don't want no shouting going on here. Devil don't want no hand clapping going on here. Man, if nothing else moves the crowd, that one will. Because nobody wants to identify with the devil. It'll even get Sister Sourpuss and Brother Bad Attitude going. Because the devil don't want no shouting going on here. Hey, if the only way you worship is by singing about what the devil don't want, you got problems. How about when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he has done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise God for saving me. Somebody ought to shout to the Lord right now. I know we got to be careful. We don't want a nightclub at it, atmosphere in church, do we? But when we're singing and worshiping God, hey, let's all get on board. You can't sing the songs. You can still say, I love you, Jesus. God, I praise you. Be seated. I'm not done. We got to know what time it is to know where we are. And there is a quotient that is very important in all of this, and it's called the gospel. And Jesus said in that same narrative, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now, you might differ with me, but I do not believe in worldwide revival in the sense that everybody's going to pray through. Everybody's going to love God. Everybody's going to... I wish it were so. But realistically, that's not happening. It's not happening. But I do believe that the gospel will be preached in all the world. On the day of Pentecost, Peter preached. This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, saying, In the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Anybody still believe that today? I'm glad that's one of the signs of the latter times, too. I believe the Holy Ghost is being poured out all around the world and should be poured out all around the world. And I thank God for faithful missionaries who sacrifice much and even imperil themselves to take this gospel to foreign nations. I grew up in a missionary home. My father was a missionary for almost 40 years. I grew up in the concrete jungle of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Today, the ninth largest city in the world. Over 20 million people in the metropolitan area. And so, I know what it's like on that side of things. I'm part of a missionary family that today has over 20 preachers in our family. My grandmother was illiterate. I won't go into all that, but she was illiterate from Chile. My dad was from Chile. His mother was an orphan. And she grew up on the streets. She met my grandfather who was years older, married at a young age. She had 14 children, only six lived to adulthood. Eight children died either at birth or infancy 
due to the elements. And so she never learned to read or write, but she loved the Word of God. And she would have somebody read to her every day. And it got to where if you missed a word, she'd catch you. She knew it enough to catch it. And she grew up in abject poverty. My father grew up in abject poverty. And my grandmother, she never prayed for a nice home or anything else. She asked God to give her over 20 preachers in her family. And today she's long gone, but today there are over 20 preachers in our family. And I love missions. I love missionaries. I love doing what I can to help missionaries. I love going to the mission field. I love the sincerity that you encounter, the hunger that you encounter many times. And, and, and yet, we are falling behind, folks. Seriously, we're falling behind. Now, growing up in a missionary home and on the mission field does not mean that I have a greater burden than you. But it does mean that I have a perspective, perhaps, that you might not. Repeatedly, when I go to Sao Paulo, Brazil, and I stand there and I look around, any of you that have been there know what I'm saying. You can look as far in any direction as the eyes can see, and all you will see is high-rise buildings. Tens of thousands of them. Now there is no way that you will ever get into those buildings. There is no way you'll ever knock on those doors, Brother Urshan. There just isn't. Realistically, there isn't. Amen. You're all getting quiet now because you kind of know where I'm headed. And this is the same in great urban centers all around the world. I have a series of photographs saved on my phone of some of the great cities of the world and the densely packed population. There is no way you will ever do door-to-door -door evangelism in some of those cities. Praise God. My phone decided to wake up. And so we have an obligation still, don't we? Can we talk about technology for just a few moments? Can we, I, I, think, I think discussion and debate is healthy. And I've heard the arguments on both sides, and I understand the issues, and I understand the fears. And there are going to be those that are going to say that's the same argument that the TV crowd had. Two big differences. Number one, many of them were just looking for an excuse to okay television. And we're still against it. And don't lump us together with that. Secondly, I'm talking about technology all of us have in our pockets and in our purses. That's where the people are at. I don't know what your experience is, and your experience might be different, and you have a better way, that's great. But in our assembly the last couple of years, the vast majority of those that have come to our church services came because of our online presence. Nobody had ever met them before. I'm not taking away from the importance of person-to-person -person contact. And personal evangelism, it doesn't absolve us of that. But that's where the people are. And some of them are looking and some of them are searching. And you know what? We're not just connecting with people in our area, but we're hearing back from people in Africa, in Asia, places all over that somehow catch our services. What should we do? Should we deny that to them because we're afraid of one another? Can I just be honest here a little bit? I know that what I'm saying uh, in, in, in this part of the message is probably going to doom me to a ministerial Siberia somewhere in exile. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
That's okay. If it happens, I'll just write a book or something. Or become a Walmart greeter. But as long as I'm standing here, I'm going to tell you, we have an obligation to our world. And maybe God has put some of these things in our hands for a reason. Somebody told me years ago, I don't believe in none of that uh, Bible study and personal evangelism and all that. And we got more new people in our church than you do. Number one, I'd be afraid to make that boast because God can turn the water off anytime. Secondly, if, it's, if what you're doing is working for you, honey, go ahead, do it. But don't, don't label everybody else as a bunch of compromisers and liberals. I don't want to abuse this pulpit here this morning. Pastor, you can jerk on my coattail anytime you want. But it's not fair to label everyone who's using technology and whatever means as a liberal and a compromiser. Some of us still love this truth. We love holiness. We love Acts 2.38. I'm not promoting it. I'm not saying you have to do it. If you don't want to, help yourself. Talked about it sometime back at a meeting. Boy, I lost a lot of friends over it. But the missionaries came to me privately and said, Thank you, Brother Alviar. What would we have done without it? And somebody said, well, we've always given more license to the missionaries than to anybody else. Well, what's the difference? Atlanta's a metro area of six or seven million people. We don't have much time, folks. We don't have much time. They need to hear this truth. They need to hear this gospel. You can say us four and no more, but that's not enough for some of us. Come on now. Again, I respect men on both sides of the argument, but it's an insult to insinuate that everybody who uses technology in any way is a compromiser and selling out to Hollywood. No, we're not. And some of us are preaching against abortion and homosexuality and sin and perversion. And maybe they'll shut us down someday. But in the meantime, we're letting the world know where we stand. So we don't want them to see our worship. What's wrong with our worship? I don't want to focus on some little sister that's dancing and shouting so somebody can make fun of her either. But what happened on the day of Pentecost? They didn't stay in that upper room. They came out and danced and shouted and made some people mock and say they're drunk, but others said, what is this? Somebody's going to laugh. Somebody's going to make fun. Somebody's going to make jokes. But somebody's going to say, what are these people feeling? Let's lift our hands and worship him. I'm going to try to speed to a close here. You know what's amazing to me, brethren, is that some of those that lambast some of us the most know everything that's going on. Isn't that amazing? And if you make a gaffe or say something that maybe didn't come out just right, it gets spread all over Pentecost before the day is out. How did they know? Just like the Sanhedrin's watching me right now. And they're going to take what I'm saying and they're going to make hay out of it, but that's okay. It's still true anyhow. 
Reason why we don't have some of that on you is just because it wasn't recorded, honey. You can't preach 20, 30, 40 years without messing up, without saying something you wish you hadn't said. And if that's what you want to use to discredit the whole thing, help yourself. But what we need to be doing is praying for one another and encouraging one another. That's the time we're living in. Now be seated. I'm almost done. Serious. Amen. But, but, but since I'm on the subject, I do want to sound out some concerns, okay? Anybody that would use live streaming or audio or whatever to try to proselyte people from other good, truth-loving churches is wrong. Look at what we're doing. Come over here to us. That's wrong. It used to be you could tell people not to go certain places that you didn't want them to fellowship with, but now they can drop in on the services real easy. And you don't think they're doing it, but they're doing it anyway. And maybe what we need to do is teach them so that when they see something that isn't right, they'll say, I don't want no part of that. We're worried about losing folks to liberal churches. Maybe we just need to change the way we preach a little bit. And, and give them some reasons why we stand where we stand and what we do what we do. <laughs> Secondly, I think it's wrong for a pastor to try to pastor anybody else's saints vicariously. And if you go online and you hear somebody preach something that your pastor doesn't preach, don't use that as a crutch to begin to sow discord in the church. You stick with your pastor. Thirdly, if we're doing this just for a show, just to show out, we're wrong. Fourthly, online church will never be better than in-house church. Don't set your lazy self at home just because you can watch the service because you didn't feel like taking a bath and getting ready. There is no duplicate. There is no substitute for being in the house of God and in the presence of God. And anybody who says otherwise is just wrong. In his presence is fullness of joy. And at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Last week, I went to the Bible Museum in Pigeon Forge. And I heard again how that when William Tyndale was burned at the stake in England. Because, listen... He wanted every English person to have their own Bible in their language. So they burned him at the stake because those people were not, they were not smart enough to have the Bible for themselves. Supposedly his dying prayer was that God would open the eyes of the king of Israel, uh, king of, uh, of, of, of Britain who happened to be King Henry VIII, who enjoyed beheadings and, and, and killing people. And so three years later, King Henry VIII authorized the Bible in the English language to be placed in every church, but it had to be chained to a pulpit. And only the vicar or whoever the guy was could read it. Other people didn't have access to it. So they started having readers and every day somebody would go there and they would read from that book and the local townspeople would come in just so they could hear the word of God read. And they would weep and cry. Do you realize how blessed we are today to have the Bible in our reach? 
Don't some of these other people in the world at least deserve a chance to hear the gospel? Whether it's preaching at a church service, whether it's a podcast like your podcast, amen, or other means. How about an online Bible study? Yeah, you got it, so you don't care one way or the other, do you? But they need it. Lift your hands, just praise them, praise them, praise them, praise them, praise them, praise them. I'm going to close. I'm going to close. There is a great need today also for more missionaries, more pastors, more evangelists, more teachers to rise up in the church. Maybe God will call some in this meeting because the world needs this gospel. Lastly, but not least, Jesus said in Luke chapter 4, when he came back from the wilderness after being tempted of the devil, and he picked up the scroll of the book of Isaiah, and he read the place, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. We love that, don't we? It's a powerful verse, but the next one also is important, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. What year is that, my friend? Was it the year he was in right then, Brother Adkins? Was that the year? Was it the year of his ministry? If so, which year? He preached over three years. Which year are we going to focus on? Is it the final year when he went to Calvary? Is that the acceptable year of the Lord? Is that the climax? Was that the one he was referring to? What is the acceptable year of the Lord? Is it a year that's already passed? If so, who's going to tell these young people that they came too late? Too bad, so sad. Our best days are in the past. Wish you'd have been around 40 years ago. Pentecost will never rise to that height again. If you'd only been around in the brush hour days, is that it? Is that it? We're going to have to look at our sons and grandchildren in the eye and say, do the best you can, but the best year is already behind. If it's a year that's in front of us, then does that mean in the meantime we have to settle for second best until that year gets here? What is the acceptable year of the Lord? Now some of you Bible scholars might know the answer to that, but I'm just going to give you my take on it, okay? The acceptable year of the Lord is the year we're in right now. God wants to work right now. God wants to save right now. God wants to deliver right now. God is a healer right here today. God is a miracle worker right now. Come on, can you stand to your feet? Anybody believe what I'm saying? As long as I have breath in my body, I'm going to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. This is the best year of our lives. This is the best time to be living in. The coming of the Lord draws nigh, but God is working. I wonder if at the close of this service, I don't know what the protocol is, but especially if we could have some of our young people come and gather near the front. Young people that want to fall in love with this truth, fall in love with this message, fall in love with this gospel. Come on, don't do it because I asked you. Do it because you want to. Can we do it? Man, you don't walk into McDonald's like that. Come on, folks. Get on up here. This 
show some hunger. Let's show some desire. Anybody know what time it is? It's revival time. It's miracle working time. It's soul saving time. Come on, lift your hands and begin to pray as they start singing today. Let's worship the Lord. Let's talk to him right now. Let's ask God to help us, can we? Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. You got to know where, what time it is to know where you're at. I believe these are great times we're living in. Come on, saints, let's pray. Let's raise up our voices. Raise up our voices and pray. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Less of me and more of you is what I need. Show me your glory. Show me your power. Less of me and more of you is what I need.
don't you make it your prayer? Why don't you make it your cry? Take my hands, Lord, take my feet. Touch my heart, Lord, speak through me. You can use anything, Lord, you can use me. I want him to use me. I want him to use me. Just speak it out as they sing. Make it your prayer. You can use anything, Lord. You can use me. Let it be your request. Take my hands. Take my hands, Lord. Take my feet. Touch my heart, Lord. Speak through me. You can use anything. a moment but you have just heard one of the most and this is not I'm not saying this tongue in cheek timely words in the exodus they looked at Moses and said we don't want manna anymore they actually said our soul loathes literally hates this light food. And there is a professional Pentecostal world that, that is so jaded and so hardened that they, they literally turn off Acts 2.38, Deuteronomy 6.4 preaching. Give us meat, give us meat. And while the meat was in their mouth, God smote them for their gluttony. the Mars Hill congregation that Paul preached to, they spent all their time to hear some new thing. But you know what God wants from us? This is a book of Acts, church. This is a book of action that we're living. God, we're not here trying to hear some new deep revelation, although we want a timely word and we want to dig into the word of God. But I'm looking to see a new thing happen. God said, behold, I do a new thing. That ministry means look at this new thing I'm going to do. I want to see somebody get baptized. I want to see somebody get the Holy Ghost. I want to see somebody get delivered. I want to see somebody's name written in the Lamb's book of life. And I'm excited about it. I'm convinced that, that how we conduct ourselves in ministry is how we'll respond to these this Bible preaching if you don't win souls and the preacher preaches on Acts 238 you'll check out and take a nap that's because you don't win souls that's because you're not doing a new thing that's because you're all about yourself and all about me 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 but if you got a person sitting next to you that came to church for the first time and you've been witnessing to them and that preacher gets up there and starts to preach on Acts 238, something on the inside of you is going to start doing flip-flops. Same message, same atmosphere, but you're the thing that's different. You're the one that's different. That's what we're looking for. I want to do a new thing. I want to be a part of a new thing. The essence of revive is new life. Praise God. What are we supposed to do? You said it so well, Bishop Alviar. What are we supposed to do? Not reach them? Stop, stop podcasting. Stop telling people Acts 238. You're trying to steal people. Tell it, tell it. 
to the monk in the monastery that got the revelation of the mighty God in Christ and writes us in Italian asking us not to stop. Tell that to the apostolic teenagers that say, I'm able to send a link and somebody can hear the oneness of God because I don't really know how to explain it, but I know it's right. Tell it, tell it to the young man who called me or texted me, I should say. I could see the timestamp. It was about two something in the morning. And he said, I am so far from God. I, I'm a cross dresser. I rebelled. He said, I'll regret this tomorrow because I'm drunk right now. But all I know is when I turn on these services, I can feel what I felt when I was a little boy. Please don't beat on us while we try to save your grandchildren. Please don't criticize us while we reach for every person that we can because we're running out of time. Now is the time. Today is the day. Preach his word. Proclaim his word from the mountaintops. Oh, I want him to sing it again. I want you to lift your hands. I want you to hear what the preacher said today. Let's love God. I want him to use me today. Anything, Lord, you can use. I want him to use me right now. I want him to use this generation. You can use anything, Lord. You can I want him to speak to us. I want to be sensitive to his voice. Touch my heart. Touch my heart, Lord. Speak to me. You can use you can use anything, Lord. Give glory to him. He loves Thank you, Jesus. Brother Alviar, my grandfather told me that when harvest time was new, they called him a compromiser. They labeled him a compromiser. I can take you to missionaries and apostolic pastors right now that got the Holy Ghost listening to radio preaching. I can take you to them right now and the multitudes that were saved because the word of God went forth. You don't have to embrace Hollywood to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want my children and my grandchildren to hear an apostolic voice instead of being drawn to compromising people that really are compromising. They make the grass look so green on the other side and everything's a big party and it's a lie. Oh, there's got to be a certain sound. There's got to be a trumpet in the middle of it all that said, this is the way of the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. 
You will never replace in-person church. They were all with one accord in one place. Oh, but we can draw them. We can preach. We can bring this message to this world. Amen. What a message. Thank you, Brother Alviar, for preaching the word of the Lord. Take this. Share this. Meditate upon this. Gather up the fragments that nothing remain. And let it strengthen you. Praise God. Praise God. Let's come tonight anticipating a great move of the Holy Ghost. Come ready to pray. Let's be here for prayer at 7 o'clock, service at 7.30. For ministers and their family, there is a hospitality room in here before tonight's service. We have a meal prepared for every minister that is here today that has come to East Coast Conference. You and your family, we want you to join us in the Godair Family Life Center. Tonight, Bishop Johnny Godair is going to be preaching the word of the Lord. Let's come expecting a great move of the Holy Ghost. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.